Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful day in which you have given to us. Lord, I pray that you would please be with our hearts and our minds. I pray that you would please be with my heart, dear Lord, that you would bring back to my remembrance and give me mental clarity so that these things may be properly communicated to your people. For Father, you are seeking to speak to each and every one of us. And so I pray from the minister on down that you would soften and subdue our hearts. We pray that you give us a mind to understand and to comprehend. For we have come here not to merely hear the words of a man, but that we may hear the words of heaven, especially in light of the times in which we are living. And I pray a very special prayer for those of us who are classed as young people. I just pray, dear Lord, that you would give us the ability to surrender everything to you, for there is a great work that you have for us to do as great young men and young women. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in light of that, let us open up our Bibles to the book of Psalms. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Psalms. Let's turn to Psalms chapter 105. We're going to turn to our opening text, Psalm chapter 105. Psalm chapter 105, and we're going to start in verse 17. We're going to start in verse 17. Now, as we're going to go through this week, we're going to go over the experiences of different Bible characters. So yesterday, we went over the experience of Isaac, and in light of what we read for our opening text, whose experience do you think we're going to go over? We're going to go over the experience of Joseph. Now, do you think that the experience of Joseph has many and very practical lessons for you and I, especially as young people? Yes, very many practical lessons. Psalm chapter 105, we're going to start in verse 17. It says, he sent a man before them, even what? Even Joseph. Now, how old was Joseph approximately when he was sent down into Egypt as a slave? He was 17. Now, generally speaking, are 17 year olds considered to be men? No, but we're going to see that there was an experience that Joseph went through that made him into the man that he was, even though he was only 17 years old. Because contrary to popular opinion, you don't have to be a grown up person to be a man or a woman. Because there are very many people who are older in age, who are in their 30s and 40s and 50s, but in mindset and disposition, they are still little children, both mentally and spiritually. But the principle is, is that God wants us to understand that we don't have to wait till we get older to start acting like men and women. And don't get me wrong, yes, there is a maturity that naturally comes with the accumulation of years, but merely living will not make you a man or a woman. So Psalms 105, it says, he sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a what? Yes, he was a slave. Whose feet they hurt with fetters, he was laid in iron. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord did what unto him? Now, in principle, what mechanism was actually trying Joseph? Now, where was Joseph during this time period? What country? He was in Egypt. So it's really the Egyptian experience that was trying him. Now, did God put Joseph into slavery? Did God eventually put Joseph into prison? But God was working through those circumstances to develop his character. Does that make sense? It says, whose feet they hurt with fetters, he was laid in iron until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. The king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all of his what? And ruler of all of his substance. Now, did he have a lot of substance? Yes, he did. This was the greatest nation on the planet. It says he made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance. It didn't stop at that. It says to bind his princes and his pleasure and to teach his senators what? Wisdom. So God exalted Joseph to a place of preeminence where he had a superseding influence 
over the Egyptians. Now, in light of that, as we take a look at our screen, now does everybody see this? Now, in light of our subject matter, who is this a representation of? This is a representation of Joseph. Joseph, a mighty man of what he eventually became while he was in Egypt. Notice what the prophet says. Again, this is our theme uh, statement for this, for this week of prayer. It says, sacred history presents many illustrations of the results of what type of education? True education. It presents many noble examples of men whose characters were formed under what type of direction? Divine direction. Men whose lives were a blessing to their fellow men and who stood in the world as representatives of God. Among these were Joseph, Daniel, Moses, Elisha, and Paul. The greatest statesman, the wisest legislator, one of the most faithful of reformers, and except him who spoke as never man spake, the most illustrious teacher this world has known. Now, what we want to understand as we go through this message for this evening, we want to understand what were the circumstances and principles that led to the development of Joseph becoming such a mighty man. Now, who here, by show of hands, wants to be a great man or a great woman for the Lord? And it won't just be in certain circumstances, just greatness in the sight of God. It will also be greatness in the sight of men. You know, the Bible says in the book of Luke that Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God only. No, it says, and in favor with God and man. So by default, as we grow in our connection with God, we should become more useful to those around us. Does that make sense? It says the greatest statesman, the wisest legislator. So did Joseph have a very preeminent position? Yes, he did. Does it take a lot of ability in order to literally run a country? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. All right. Now, in light of that, when you see this picture, what comes to the imagination? Are they playing a nice, fun game with with, with Joseph? Is that what's taking place here? What is taking place in this picture? This was the starting point of the realness of Joseph's education. Let's turn in our Bible to the book of Genesis. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. And we're going to notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 37. It says... We'll start in verse 1, and when you have it, you can say amen. Amen. It says, and Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah. His father's wives and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many what? Now verse 3 is depicting the fact that that, uh, Jacob or Israel was showing partiality to Joseph. Now do you think it was a good thing that Jacob or Israel was showing partiality to Joseph? No, it wasn't. Do you think that this created jealousy in the hearts of his other siblings? Yes, Yes, it did. Now, did Jacob show even partiality with his wives? Yes, he did, unfortunately. Now, who was Jacob's favorite wife? Rachel. Verse 4. It says, "And, And when his brethren saw their father loved him more than all his brethren, they loved him. They hated him. And could not speak peaceably unto him. They were so filled with hatred that they literally couldn't even smile in his face. It says, and Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it to his brethren and they hated him yet the what? Yet the more. 
And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed, for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright, and behold, your sheaf stood round about, and made obeisance to my sheaf. Now, do you think that his brethren were happy and elated about this dream? No, they weren't. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dream. So the Bible has already depicted three times that his brothers hated him. Now, in light of all of this hatred being multiplied even three times, what do you think his brothers wanted to do unto Joseph? They wanted to kill him. Literally kill him. Shed his blood and slit his throat. That's literally what they wanted to do unto Joseph. And this is why the Bible says, do not entertain hatred in the heart. It does not matter what has been done unto you. If you cherish this demon, it will lead you into dark paths. It says, and his brethren said to him, shalt thou indeed, we read that already, verse 9, and he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, now you would think that by this time Joseph would have some type of understanding that his brothers really didn't like him saying this. But why do you think he said it unto them again? There was a couple reasons. One, it was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But another reason is because despite of all of their ill treatment, Joseph still loved his brothers. Even though it was painfully obvious they did not like him, he still loved them. He still loved them. You see, Joseph was a type of Christ. It says in verse 10, And he told it to his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and, my, and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? Now we're going to skip down a little pass and get to the main crux. Uh, it says in verse 16, and he said, I seek my brethren. So Joseph is going to find his brethren who are tending the flocks. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, they departed hence, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near to them, they conspired against him to have a jolly good time. To slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Again, we're going to skip a little bit down. Verse 23, And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was, that was on him. And they took him and cast him into the pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. Now, just for the sake of context, the reality is, is that, unfortunately, they, they put Joseph in this position. They put him in the pit. Now, eventually, what were they trying to do to Joseph again? They wanted to kill him. But eventually, what happened to Joseph? We're not going to read all the text in Genesis. Unfortunately, what happened to him? They sold him into slavery. You see, back then, there was no such thing as, you know, Google tracking and, and Apple tracking and, and all of these devices that we have now to keep tabs on one another. So the fact that they were selling him into slavery, into Egypt, this was literally, as it were, a death sentence. To be a slave in a foreign nation was a fate worse than death. And unfortunately, this was the fate that they co-signed their brother to. Now, in light of that, how do you think Joseph responded to this experience? Do you think that Joseph was happy that his brothers were selling him into slavery? Let's notice. This says, with a trembling heart, he looked forward to the future. What a change in situation from the tenderly cherished son to the despised and helpless slave. Alone and friendless, what would be his lot in the strange land to which he was going? For a time, Joseph gave himself up to uncontrolled grief and terror. You see, because the truth of the matter is, in Joseph's mind, he was coming to the, to, to the terms with the fact that he was never going to see his family again. His life was going to be forever changed. 
It says, but in the providence of God, notice, even this experience was to be a what? Even this traumatic experience was to be a blessing to Joseph. Now, by show of hands, who here has ever gone through trauma? Who here has ever gone through trauma? Whether it's the abandonment of, of a parent, whether it's going through some uh, serious physical malady, or whatever the case may be, these are all traumatic experiences. And though, God, though it wasn't God's will for us to directly go through these things, even these episodes in our life, God will use for our blessing. You see, because many times when we go through trauma, Satan uses it as an opportunity to drive us from our Lord and Savior. But it doesn't matter what the trauma is, we should not permit it to get between us and our creator. It says, but in the providence of God, even this experience was to be a blessing to him. He had learned in a few hours that which years might not otherwise have what? You see... The reality is that the more trauma God permits us to go through, he's actually trying to accelerate our character development. You see, because the truth of the matter is, we're about to go through a time of trouble such as never was. And if we're going to go through this time, we need to know how to deal with stress. Now, did Jesus know how to deal with stress? Yes, he did. And this is why he was able to go through the crisis of his life. All right, getting to a point. Then his th thoughts turned to his father's God. In his childhood, he had been taught to love and fear him. His soul thrilled with the high resolve to prove himself true to God. Under all circumstances to act as became a subject of the king of what? Of heaven. Notice, one day's experience had been the turning point in Joseph's life. Just one day. Its terrible calamity had transformed him from a petted child to a what? Yes. To a man. So this experience that Joseph went through, it turned him from a boy to a grown man, even though he was only 17. Again, we do not have to be grown up persons to in principle be a man or a woman. All right, it says thoughtful, courageous, and self-possessed. Now notice this statement, continuing in inspiration. Again, this is from the book Education. All who in this world render true service to God or man receive a preparatory training in the school of roses and lilies. In the school of sorrow. The weightier the trust, the higher the service, the closer is the test and the more severe the discipline. So if God is going to really use us, we're going to have to be severely disciplined. You see, because as we see even through the experiences of the Bible, God can rarely trust us as human beings with promotion and exaltation. We can go down the list of how many God-fearing men have made incredibly stupid decisions because they were taking their eyes off God. You know, we're told in the word of God of the experience of Solomon. Now, was Solomon a great man? Yes, he was. If Solomon had continued in faithfulness, you could argue that he would have been the greatest king that this world had ever seen. But did Solomon lose his way? Yes, he did. Now, David. Now, did David go through a school of suffering and sorrow? Yes, he did. But did even David make very bad decisions? Yes, he did. This just goes to show that human nature is very fickle. And this is why we cannot trust ourselves, especially as young people. Now, because, you know, Disney tells us that we should follow our heart. As we watch Pocahontas and all of this all of, all of these spiritualistic movies were constantly being told that we should follow our hearts. But what does the Bible say about the human heart? It's deceitful and a little wicked. Desperately wicked. Now, who here has ever been desperate to drink water? Who here has ever been desperate to drink water? Now, if you went without water for three days, would you be in desperation to get a glass of water? Yes, would you be fighting and crawling to get to it? Yes. 
The Bible says that so much as we would go after that drink of water, after not having it for three days, the Bible says that we are that desperately wicked. We crave unrighteousness. So in light of that, we must be yoked to Christ so that we can resist the pleadings of our flesh. Does that make sense? It says the closer is the test and the more severe the discipline. So this was the first epoch in, in uh, Joseph's training. Now next, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. So Joseph gets down to Egypt. Now, does Joseph's lot change? Does he, does he start to experience some prosperity? Yes, he does. Notice verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So even this heathen man was able to see the power of Joseph's God. Verse 4, And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had, he put into his what? It says, and it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house, and in the what? And in the field, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not, and he knew not all he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person, and well what? He was a goodly person and very well favored. God was able to bless, bless Joseph as a result of his faithfulness. You see the prosperity that Joseph experienced was not as the result of a direct miracle. Let us just have a quick word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the abiding presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we just pray that your reverence may be with us. Dear Lord, you know that we are not intentionally seeking to do anything irreverent. I just pray that you would please keep us to this end. Concentrate our minds in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll just say very kindly, if we have any devices, please either put them or on silent or please turn them off. Again, this is not as a means to attack anyone, but especially when God is trying to make a point, Satan will raise up some type of distraction in order to deviate our minds. Now, again, this is just the principle. When the angels are in the direct presence of the deity, is there any form of irreverence? You see, when we literally enter these sacred precincts, God is abiding with us. He's literally in this place. It was so much to the point that when Moses was in the presence of God, visually uh, represented in the burning bush, God spoke out of the bush and said, remove your sandals from off your feet, for the place that you are standing is what? The place that you are standing is holy ground. Now, in light of that, this was the next epoch in Joseph's experience. Now, does anybody know what this represents? You see, Joseph was being prosperous. He was learning how to govern the affairs of the state. He was learning how to manage and organize. He was learning languages and all of these different things. But amidst the prosperity, temptation and danger lurked. This is a representation of Potiphar's wife. Now, was Potiphar's wife wanting Bible studies from Joseph? Is that what happened? Was Potiphar's wife trying to learn how to be a God-fearing Christian? Is that what happened? Let's read in the Bible. Genesis 39, starting in verse 7. It says, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon what? Joseph and said, lie with me. 
Now again, was she saying lie with me because she needed some medical missionary work? No. She wanted to fornicate with him. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house. And he hath committed all that he hath unto my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me uh, but thee. Because thou art his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against Potiphar? Is that what Joseph said? You see, now he definitely didn't want to, want to sin against Potiphar, but his thoughts immediately went to God. We're told in Patriarchs and Prophets that, that Joseph was living as if he was always in the immediate presence of God. Now, this is the reality. Are we always in the immediate presence of God? Of God. Yes. Everything that we do, the angel is faithfully recording it. God sees everything that is taking place. Now, in light of that, it says, And it came to pass about this time, in verse 11, that Joseph went into the house to do his business. And there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and did what? Now, the Bible says that we should flee fornication. Don't even try to reason with it. And fled and got him out. Notice this. Now, does this appear to be an attractive woman? You see the visual representation that's given in Patriarchs and Prophets that this temptation, it was so sudden it was so seductive, but did Joseph, was he able to resist it? He was able to resist it because Joseph was a Christian. But unfortunately, this is from volume two of the testimonies, licentiousness is the special sin of this age. Now, when this is licentiousness, what is this referring to? This is talking about sexual immorality. Never did vice lift its deformed head with such boldness. You know that there is no surer way to get demon possessed than by engaging in sexual immorality. If you want to be yoked up with Satan, just, just engage in sexual immorality. This says the iniquity which abounds is not merely confined to the unbeliever and the scoffer. Would that this were the case, but it is not. Many men and women who profess the religion of Christ are what? You mean that even in the church, there are professed believers practicing abominable forms of wickedness? I wonder. Even some who profess to be looking for his appearing are no more prepared for that event than Satan himself. This is specifically talking about us as Seventh-day Adventists. Even many of us who profess to believe in the third angel's message, even the highest tenets of present truth are practicing sexual immorality. Now, the reality is this. Are those who practice sexual immorality, are those persons going to heaven? Let's turn it our to the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, this is not to be confused. What God is communicating, this is not a communication of hatred towards those of us who engage in these things. But the reality is we cannot have death and life at the same time. First Corinthians chapter six, starting in verse nine, the Bible says, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of what? Be not deceived. Now, why do you think God is saying, be not deceived? Yes, because there's such great danger of deception. And again, we mentioned this before. How many times do we see worldly people, celebrities, and even politicians and all these things get up and accept all of these awards, and then you find out that they're committing adultery on their wives with three different women? But the first person that they think is God. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So again, God is very clear. Those who practice evil are not going to heaven. Point blank period. But notice verse 11. And such were some of what? 
You see, this is the great glory of redemption. That it doesn't matter what we have been degraded in, Christ's Holy Spirit can literally rejuvenate us into the image of God. There are going to be people in heaven who used to practice homosexuality. There are going to be people in heaven who used to be drunkards and hooked on crack cocaine. But as a result of the presence of the Holy Spirit, they were reformed. It says, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our what? You see, our greatest need is the Holy Spirit. Dear young people, the greatest thing that we should ask God for is for the presence of his Holy Spirit within our lives. Notice. Anybody know what this is? This is a symbol Now, let me just ask this question. Do you think that this man is watching 3ABM? Do you think that this man is watching the Hope Channel? Do you think that he's watching a nice nature documentary on on, uh, tortoises? Unfortunately, this is a symbol of a man who's addicted to pornography. Now, do you think that pornography is a very great issue amongst us as Generation Z? And especially us as young men, the vast majority of us as young men, especially in this generation, are hardcore addicted to pornography. Notice, pornography statistics. This is actually from a very powerful outlet called Covenant Eyes. This is a Christian outlet that actually helps people to overcome the addiction of pornography. They're doing some very good work. Notice this. 64% of worldly men say they watch porn at least once a month. Is that what that says? That says 64% of Christian men watch pornography on a regular basis. Not worldlings, but Christians. And even the women, it says 15%. I can promise you these statistics are much higher. I can promise you. And even men professing to preach the third angel's messages are addicted to pornography and have the audacity to get behind God's pulpit and preach this message. It's a literal insanity. Why we skip past this? Anybody know who this is? With one accord, Billie Eilish. Now, is this woman a professor of the third angel's message? Is she seeking to spread the gospel to the entire world in this generation? Billie Eilish is a worldly singer. Now, this woman, at least to this uh, point, I believe, has won seven Grammys. She's only 22 years old. I wonder who is forwarding this woman's career. You see, because we believe that these people get to these positions merely because of their talent. You know, I was watching an episode uh, of uh, of a ministry called Little Light Studios. Anybody heard of Little Light Studios? I was watching a segment on Little Light Studios and there was this woman who used to be involved in Hollywood and she was saying point blank period that in order to get into these positions, especially the women, literally have to sleep with almost every man, every producer, every director. And again, people think that they are getting to these positions merely because of their talent. Notice what she says. Billie Eilish says watching porn from what age? 11 really destroyed my brain. Now, mind you, is Billie Eilish a God-fearing Christian? But even this dear, uh, unfortunate woman that is caught up in this worldliness realizes what the pornography did to her brain and her mind. Notice what she says. I think porn is a disgrace. I used to watch a lot of porn, to be honest. I started watching porn when I was 11. I think it really destroyed my brain and I feel incredibly devastated that I was exposed to so much porn. Skip past. It says the first few times I, you know, had sex, I was not saying no to things that were not good. It was because I thought that's what I was supposed to, to be attracted to. You see, the reality is, brothers and sisters, especially us as young people, One of the greatest things that we can do by God's grace is to go through this time of our experience without allowing our sexual nature to be depraved. One of the greatest gifts that you can give to your adult self is sexual purity. Anybody know what this is? This is a symbol of young men and young women 
having a good time. Do you think that there's anything wrong with this picture? Some people say no. Some people say yes. Now, do you think that it's appropriate that this dear young man has this dear young woman upon his back like this? Now, approximately, how old do you think this young man is? Maybe 15, 16? How old do you think that this young woman is? Now, by the age of 15, 16, for this uh, young man and young woman, have they already uh, gone through puberty or started to go through puberty? So they now are sexually attracted to the opposite sex. Now, just by default, when you are this hugged up close to a woman that you are, a young girl that you are attracted to, do you think that it is going to sexually arouse you? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You see, the reality is, brothers and sisters, Satan has conditioned our mind to believe that things like this are okay. Now, who here is a father? My show of hands. If you had a young daughter at this age and you saw her riding upon the back of a, of a young boy like this, how would that make you feel naturally? Yes, you would feel indignant naturally. I mean, because literally, if I had a daughter and I saw a young man daring to put my daughter on his back like that, I would pray that God would give me the ability to, in kindness, speak with that young man and tell him to put down my daughter. And then I would have a loving talk with my daughter. Notice this. Nothing can so effectually demoralize these institutions. Are we currently in an institution? Yes, we are. And our missions as the want of prudence and watchful reserve in the association of young men and young what? Do you think it is by design that boys sit on this side and girls sit on this side? Do you think that that's by design? Give them freedom to go and come as they will in each other's company, and they will regard it as a restriction of their rights to be bound about with rules and regulations. Those who plead for the liberty to associate together, notice, are soon spoiled with lovesick what? Now, what is the purpose of relationships? Marriage. Now, is a 15-year-old ready for marriage? What about a 16-year-old? But what about a 17 year old? What about an 18 year old? So if you are not ready for marriage at these ages, what is the purpose of being in a relationship? What's the purpose? The only purpose is literally for sexual immorality. And again, as young people, Satan tries to deceive our minds. Well, I care about this person. I have these feelings of intensity for this individual. But in principle, when you follow it out, it makes no sense because you're not prepared to be married. It says the ever increasing potency of vicious indulgences is so great and so strong that there is little room to hope for the recovery of souls who are thus afflicted unless they can see the matter as who sees it. You see, one of the great issues is that we don't see things the way God sees them. Satan has so embittered our minds with the current culture that we see things the way Satan sees them. And as a result of that, our spiritual discernment is so lessened that we think that there is nothing wrong with this. But notice this. But that which is most to be deplored is to see married men who have companions and children fanning around the what? And it's amazing how many uh, men in positions of trust professing to do the work of God inappropriately associating with women that are not their wives. And it is insane the amount of excuses that these professing men give in order to justify the debasing nature of their actions. These attentions but cloud the mind. Impure thoughts, indiscreet actions, unholy conduct And next, the seventh commandment is what? Is transgress. Has anybody ever heard of something called self-abuse? Anybody ever heard of something called masturbation? You see, this is one of the things that especially us as young people, the enemy will try to get us to start experimenting with. 
And again, there's no shame if, if unfortunately we have been degraded by these things. Can God reform us from these practices? God can give us victory from it, but we must surrender them to him. We must surrender them to him. We're coming down to the last point of Joseph's experience. So we first went over the fact that he went down to Egypt. And then the next, this sexual temptation with Potiphar's wife. Now this is the last episode that we're going to talk about. Now when you see this picture, what comes to the imagination? You see, this is a symbol of something called forgiveness. Do you think that we as Christians need to learn lessons of forgiveness? Yes, we do. Let's turn it up, obviously, to the book of Genesis chapter 39. As we bring this to a close, Genesis chapter 39. Not Genesis 39, actually, Genesis chapter 45, pardon me. Genesis chapter 49. So I believe we know the story to a greater or less degree. Joseph, his uh, family comes down to Egypt to get grain. And Joseph goes through all of these experiences with his brothers to find out if they have been converted. Genesis chapter 45, starting in verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried and caused every, and he cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am what? Now, how do you think that his brethren reacted to the fact that he just revealed himself as Joseph? Dumb with literal amazement. Now, why were they dumb with amazement? Because they had sent him as a slave to Egypt. Notice what the prophet says. His brothers stood motionless, dumb with fear and amazement. The ruler of Egypt, their brother Joseph, whom they had envied and would have murdered and finally sold as a slave. All their ill treatment of him passed before them. They remembered how they had despised his dreams and had labored to prevent their fulfillment. Yet they had acted their part in fulfilling these dreams. And now that they were completely in his power, he would no doubt avenge the wrong that he had what? Lord have mercy. Every time I go through the story, it makes me so emotional. Just the power of the forgiveness that God gave Joseph the ability to exercise. Again, let's read in Genesis 45. Genesis 45 and verse 4 says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you, please. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve what? You see, God permits us to go through these traumatic experiences to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth, and to save your lives by a what? By a great deliverance. You see, in this generation, those who are willing to disconnect themselves from sin, God is going to use us as young people in order to deliver them from the judgments that are going to fall upon Babylon. This is the very reason why we are at this institution. This is why God has conducted all of these things for us is so that we can be prepared like Joseph was to, to uh, be able to initiate a great deliverance. Verse 8. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but what? But God. And again, this is not saying that God moved upon his brothers to hate him and to sell him into slavery, but God overruled it for his purposes. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of uh, all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste thee and go up to my father and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made him lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me and do what? And tarry not. Notice, as we bring this to a close. This is taken from the Mayo Clinic. This says forgiveness, letting go of grudges and what? 
You see, my dear young friends, if we are going to be used by the Lord, we need to learn how to forgive and how to forgive well. In light of that, let's turn our Bibles to the book of Matthew. As we seek to encapsulate this, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 43. This is the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 43. It says, Ye have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to those to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. Because again, if we merely just love the people that love us back, where is the real test of our Christianity? Verse 47. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is what? So being godly does not mean that we exercise arbitrary authority, but it is greatly revealed in how we treat those who do not like or even hate us. Now again, this is not even from a Christian outlet. Forgiveness means different things to different people, but in general, it involves an intentional decision to let go of resentment and anger. The act that hurt or offended you might always be with you, but working on forgiveness can lessen the, act of, the act's grip on you. It can free you from the control of the person who harmed you. You know, I've heard uh, many times, and this is a great analogy, that hanging on to unforgiveness and hatred is like drinking poison while expecting the person that you hate to die. But notice, forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting or excusing the harm done to you. So forgiveness, even though you love them and you exercise forgiveness, it does not mean that you just, uh, you just uh, permit them to continue in their transgression. You tell them what they are doing is wrong, and if they persist in it, then you need to set up some boundaries. You see, the reality is that some of us have even been sexually molested. Now, should we exercise forgiveness towards a person who has sexually molested us? Yes, we should, even though it's hard. But does that mean that we need to go on a picnic with the person who sexually molested us? No, it doesn't. What are the benefits of forgiving someone? Healthier relationships, improved mental health, less anxiety, stress, hostility, fewer symptoms of depression, lower blood pressure, a stronger immune system, so on and so forth. And at the bottom it says, what are the effects of holding a grudge, bringing anger and bitterness? Do you know that when we hang on to unforgiveness and anger, it literally suppresses our immune system? Many people who are struggling with serious chronic diseases are in that condition merely because they're hanging on to unforgiveness. And my appeal is very simple. Who here wants to have an experience just like Joseph? And I just want to make a very special appeal. If you are a person who is dealing with unforgiveness in your heart towards anyone, whether young or old, and you want deliverance from these shackles, if what you have heard tonight, you are convicted in regards to something particular in your life that is setting up a barrier between you and the Savior, I just invite you to come down to the front so that we can pray. I just invite you to come down to the front that we can pray. We're not going to take very long with the appeal. Please do not just come just because it, is, it tends to be the end thing to do. If there is something in particular that you want deliverance from, whether unforgiveness or anything that has been communicated, please come to the front so that we can pray. The Bible says that where sin abounds, that God's grace doth more abound. And in light of that, let us kneel and have a word of prayer.
Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the message in which you have communicated to us this evening. Dear Lord, it's been such a blessing to my soul as well. Lord, we pray that you would please forgive us of our sins, that you would purify us from the stain of unrighteousness, Lord. Implant in our hearts a deeper desire for holiness. Father, I pray a special prayer for all of my dear young friends that have come up to the front, whether old persons, uh, older persons as well. Lord, you know why each and every person has come up to the front, and I just pray that you would attend to every specific situation. If the issue is unforgiveness, I pray that you would bring healing. If the issue is sexual, I pray that you would bring healing and restoration. The presence of God is present to heal us. Lord, I pray that while others thou art calling, please do not pass us by. We thank you so much for the blessings of the word. As the Bible tells us in the book of Psalms that you sent your word at word and you healed us. And we thank you so much for this victory. And we pray all of this in Jesus name. Amen.